I guess when you're having a good time, it always does that, doesn't it? Uh, we're, we're sponsored by the park, of course. Uh, we've got a lot of programs through the summer. We've got a, a fall program, as most of you know. And so uh, and they have schedules of that um, in the brochures. Uh, also, uh, CAS, our astronomy club, uh, Government Astronomical Society, Astronomy in the Parks Society, and uh, and our observatory. They'll be, uh, I, I haven't met you before, yeah. but I've been just assuming that you're Dr. Brenstrom. Yes, yeah, so, okay. <laughs> sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, you, you, I'll, I'll have you in a few minutes talk about what you're doing out here, if that's okay. Um, this time, uh, this, this hour is just uh, an hour to get acquainted. Uh, it's an hour to kind of social hour. I uh, would talk about the, uh, the different astronomy clubs we have in the area, what they're doing. Uh, it's, uh, I may talk a little bit, just a pitch about IDA, uh, International Arts uh, Association. Uh, and what we, if you weren't here last night, what you missed. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully if, it's, if it clears up, which we think it is, I think we've got a weather report coming. Um, uh, which you may be able to catch up on it now. Uh, maybe a little late, but we'll be a little too. But uh, first of all, uh, let's, let's look around the room. We got any uh, astronomy clubs here? Uh, but, uh, this from uh, Knoxville. Is that Knoxville here? Okay. You know of a club over there? Uh, uh, from the Knoxville Observers. Talking about after all the body. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of if you don't know Paul Lewis, uh, you, you, you haven't had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman. He's from the University of Tennessee. He's heading up the astronomy outreach program up there and has for years. Uh, I'm going to brag on Paul, but it didn't most of his reputation preceding. Uh, he's one of the best speakers that I've ever heard right. in my life, and I've heard a bunch of it. It's entertaining as long as they're informed to I got one more question. Oh. Oh, Ryan, over in uh, Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, yeah. Okay. Oh, those guys are here, I think. Uh, are Ryan guys here from Oak Ridge? Well, they are, they are but they're not in. Yeah, they came yeah. 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 early. It's too bad. It's a whole other concept. It's a whole other concept. It's a whole other concept. It's a whole other uh, Chattanooga, anyone from there? <coughs> okay, I'm just going around to some of the closer cities. Um, Memphis, he's not here either, is he? JR. Yeah, I've seen JR. JR is from Memphis. Yeah, he's from Memphis. Well, we've got one from uh, Cumberland Astronomical Society. Uh, Alan used to be the uh, president uh, for several years over there. You want to tell him a little bit about our club, Alan? Uh, yeah, basically we are a club. We're based in Gallatin, Tennessee, which is northeast of Nashville. Uh, we're a small club, very, I guess what you would call casual. We're, we're, we're not into the big, you know, Robert's Rules of Order and all this other stuff. We're just all amateur observers and enjoy looking at the night sky and having fun, which we I think it's what it's all about rather than you know something very formal but so uh, we have it varies between 25 30 members and uh, Lloyd and I are real active into the uh, outreach which we are here we're up here how many times a year half the year it seems like we're here <laughs> three times through the summer for yeah the three summer. times in the summer then we're here in uh, for this and then we're back here in uh, September for the fall star days. So, but uh, that's our main focus is outreach. And, and we meet the third Thursday, the all state, 7.30. Uh, 
in Vermont, so any of you in the area, you're welcome to come. Welcome to come visit. Normally we have a, a program and a lot of good conversations, so extremes of information and so forth. I guess you're wondering what the heck this is. <laughs> well, probably if we were old enough, we've all seen this at one time or another. Um, Mike, would you like to get it? Would you like to tell us what this is? You don't have to make a formal presentation, but none of this is formal anyway. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to have this in time for this event, so I didn't know what I was bringing. <laughs> this was released to the public here on April 10th of this year. Basically, it took 18 years to restore this film to its original color version. Uh, back in 1993, you probably know this is George Millet's 1902, A Trip to the Moon. Considered one of the first science fiction movies ever, and it's based on Will Burns' uh, Voyage to the Moon and H.G. Wells' uh, First Man in the Moon. And here we are, the classic scene that everybody remembers. It's not the man in the moon, by the way, it's the lady in the moon. French uh, cabaret singer that they hired to do that. <laughs> uh, this film was mostly deteriorated when they found it. Let me let me get a little more information on it. Let me just read this one paragraph. Trip to the Moon is a 1902 French black and white song, science fiction series. It is based loosely on From the Earth to the Moon by Bruce Bern, and she was first man in the moon. It was written and directed by George Millet assisted by his brother Gaston. The film was 14 minutes. It was projected at 16 frames per second, which was the standard frame rate at that time. It was a very popular film at the time of its release. It was the best known of the hundreds of fantasy films made by Millet. Trip to the Moon is the first science fiction film that uses innovative animation and special effects, including the well-known image of a spaceship landing in the moon. An ending sequence, uh, We'll just let this run in the background that people are talking. The ending sequence I had never seen before discovered that it was uh, considered lost and it was found in 2002. It's a 1902 film and they're still finding parts of it in 2002. It was well preserved and a complete print was discovered in a barn in France. Like many of his films, The Trip to the Moon was sold in both black and white and hand colored versions. I understand that we have 900 color versions, and this is the only surviving color version. It was so deteriorated, uh, they, they did a documentary on this disc where they showed the individual chips of film, how they peeled them off in little tiny pieces of film. And because of the digital techniques we have today, they could put it together like a jigsaw puzzle and clean it up. The missing pieces, they reassembled from black and white prints and then they colorized it using the same techniques that were in the actual color. Most of this is actual hand colored, brushed on. But they recreated it digitally where it was missing. And it took them 18 years to restore this film. Uh, the color print was found in 1993. It's in a state of almost total decomposition, frame by frame, restoration was done. <laughs> They started the frame restoration in 1999, it was completed in 2010, 11, and uh, it's just been released to the public now on Blu-ray and on DVD as a collector set. Uh, you don't buy them separately, you buy them together. And, uh, it's really nice, it's a $29 set, but it's a classic little film. Uh, the soundtrack, it's a silent film, but it does have sound on the uh, different tracks. The black and white ones have several, several audio tracks. The color version, they hired a French group called Air. I don't think you've ever heard of them. They're like electronic group. And there is a soundtrack on there. I can make the sound play, but uh, it is a sound film, so we'll worry about that. But uh, Martin Scorsese's film, Hugo, how many of you have seen that? Okay. That, Malay's films are part of that uh, story. And it's kind of generated interest in his film. You're looking at something that's like 109 years old, and we're seeing it the way people may have seen it back then. <laughs> These are the selenites. They don't use lightsabers back in 1902, they use umbrellas. <laughs> French interpretation of the Apollo 13 series. <laughs> Uh, 
And then a lot of people actually, a lot of people actually felt that way. What we used to do, Albert. That's all. Yeah. 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 We probably need Bill to talk about what he's got out there for a few minutes, which we can get somebody to go get it. But uh, right now, who uh, was out, out uh, under the stars last night? Well, we expected it to be found as what we thought. And we got it. It might clear off the map. Uh, but, uh, anyhow, I'll give you just about a minute. I just got a couple of things here. But, uh, what else did we see last night? I heard a group of people in a really mob. And uh, I think that was part of the lyrics that came over. Uh, big big I didn't get to see it. I was in a, one big one, okay. I was in the, uh, the warming tent in there, in the hospitality tent. I missed it. <laughs> I, I think I glanced out and saw shadows and stuff. I think that thing came off. Uh, uh, Was, it seemed to be an excellent night for, for seeing transparency went real good with the steadiness of the air. It's just a really good. We don't get that that often. But we could see... Uh, pardon? There's so much moisture. It's just... Yeah. Transparency went that good. But steadiness... It seemed like uh, you could see the casino division and the, and the rings in, on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no one scope had uh, up to 300 something power, 12, 12 inches. Pretty deep and uh, very steady. Pardon? Okay. So that, that was pretty good scene. Uh, we also, there's enough transparency. We saw the M81, 82, which are galaxies. Okay, Hersha Major. Uh, and also uh, 51. Venus the first thing, uh, almost depressed, not quite. It's in waning, obviously, because it's in its orbit coming back around. And uh, we'll see it progress on into a very thin crescent. It's getting brighter because it's getting closer. But the surface area is, is, is I'm in competition right now. <laughs> this is, we just saw we ran 20 minutes. I thought this was 15 minutes. There it goes. I got it in my loop. Okay. Uh, thanks for playing that. That was really neat. Um, but we, 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 we see it as going toward a crescent swing ring. And that, it's, it's very interesting to watch it fade. It's kind of like watching the lunar phases. The sand start out just spin crescent and then progress on. Uh, it's really neat. Uh, yeah. I, I, I just have to tell you this. I had a bunch of students the other night. Sent them over to the telescope to look at Venus. And the young lady looks in the eyepiece and she turns back with this crystal look on her face. She looks back in the eyepiece and she turns and she says, I didn't think the moon was up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. And, and you know, with one, with one visit to a star party, how much if you, if you want to learn, how much you can learn. Uh, it's just just a, a lot of you guys out here have been good enough to bring telescopes if you can. You know, we had, I think, two van loads come up, uh, you know, in the van service that we got to bring the general public up from the van that, That's they all really enjoy that. So, um, Saturn, it's in the casino division, very neat, and other details. And so, so it was a good night. It was a good night. Uh, I understand we have a uh, scout troop here. Matt, the one you tell us? Benetti. Benetti, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't read him all right, right? Uh, 
It's down true for 323? Yes, uh, we're based in Lynchburg and uh, uh, we'll be praying for clear skies and hope to join y'all to look at the telescope tonight if it's okay. Uh, that's, that's, Absolutely. I was telling my father, you know, he said, if it's okay, that's why we have this. This is purely outreach and, and, you know, gathering of like-minded folks and people that want to learn. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Astronomy of the Park Society, that's one of the main goals is to uh, have kids come in, families come in, uh, and learn about science through astronomy, get them started, get them interested. Not that we want everybody to be an astronomer, <laughs> but we want, we need engineers, we need scientists in this country in the worst way, we need, you know, that, that, that type of time. So this is, this is our efforts to, to try to improve that and help that situation. So, um, I wanted to know about the uh, weather, weather forecast. Okay. Uh, when I was asked at the desk, it was sort of supposed to be overcast till about 6 p.m., then it's partly cloudy from 6 to 11, and that's when their forecast ends. And okay. So we're not sure. Okay. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of iffy, but if it's partly cloudy, that means we've got areas of opportunity. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Comes I don't like know that. how good that would be, but if anybody has internet access, they might be able to get to the website that has a better, more complete forecast. But that's all uh, that they have in front of us. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, okay, we're going to let uh, one of the best salesmen I know. <laughs> he's, 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 he's real shy about that. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'll okay. let you on. Okay, you guys take care. Okay. And, uh, uh, always in the midst of that. But, uh, rubber benders. And, uh, Burgess. Optics. You can go Burgess. And if I can go to my friend, tell about what he's got. Okay. Let's see. Wes, you know, uh, pretty good for the past. That's the state. Frank, the power up over there. You can see the Saturn in through the Arctic Sea. Northern French. Northern Cap. Anyways, I've been, uh, for the last couple of years, kind of quiet. I've been developing new stuff. I had too much stuff. I didn't realize this is this place. It's a nice bird. Thank you. This is tough. I mean, there's a few of us in here who make stuff and stuff. And there's very few of us who invent stuff. And so because of that, you buy what somebody else has. And you'll notice a lot of the you'll see a lot of binoculars with the same name on it. You'll see a lot of telescopes, different names on it, because there is actually very few companies that produce optical uh, products for the amateur astronomers. Uh, so and a lot of it's been sold over the last few years. Uh, so I, I developed quite a few products with Tom back before he died, and then uh, got a little discouraged when I uh, started seeing my product show up. It, it didn't improve. Anyway, for the last two years now, I've been really quiet. I don't know, not only you know, don't look at the boards, I've been developing new products with some companies, and I kind of sold some things that I didn't before. Before I didn't uh, want to sell some of my new products, but uh, to develop some of them, I've sold some of them, and there'll be some of my products come out. They won't have, they want my name on it, I'm not going to use my name on it, but there'll be some products that I've invented that uh, will come out on the market, and for that, I think I've got some insurances now that I can get some of my products made and can't be sold. But uh, I was shocked every time a certain catalog would come to me. I'd look in and I almost see my product before I put it out. And so uh, I backed up a little bit, found some new companies that don't make finished products and are developing some products, uh, two, two or three. Got an office in China now, so I can, uh, I've had that for a while, so I can uh, better control it. Uh, the best thing that's happened, though, is China is in the WTO now. So you can sue them. You can sue the company without even going to the Chinese government. Before you had to go beg the Chinese government. Now then, you know, in China, they're strange. Uh, what was that thing? There was somebody a few years ago, right after China was petitioning to be in the WTO, and somebody made Nike shoes copies. I don't know why it's the number one thing to make over there to copy. Made. And they go over it. This is true. They took the owner of the company and executed him. I said, whoo, from one extreme to the other. We're going to make coffee and make it. Yeah, the execute guy. And, so, and the rest of the world goes, oh, we didn't ask you to kill me. I mean, we just asked you to get 
making our stuff. And they go, oh, we thought this would be good deterrent. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh, they killed some of his family too. We got a brother or something like that. And they just said, okay, see how good we are? We're going to line them up and shoot them. So I said, no, I don't think that's exactly what we wanted. Anyway, they are the WTO now, so you can. Uh, I think there's some weight behind it. So they, and one of the main agreements with the WTO was all the countries says, well, you know, we're going to let you in. Don't call the offer stuff because the Chinese love to do that. They, I mean, they love to do it. I mean, they can make weak copies. Well, what was that I heard the other day that all of our fighter jets were flying around with copy parts in it? Now they're starting to look and see where they're actually made. And like, uh, I forget what percentage of our planes are flying with parts. So they're 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 excellent. They can develop stuff too, and they've got some uh, neat products. Um, I used to tell people they can make um, big apocryphal telescopes because I remember reading on the boards where they said, "Well, they'll never make an astrophysics quality telescope because." Is they can't do it. Well, after physical telescope for them is actually nothing. All they got to do is copy it. And it's real simple. They've got the, uh, the materials to do it with. They've got the machines. They have the best machines in the world. I went to a city called Xi'an, and it's a, it's a, there's a military, Xi'an Electro Optical, the name of the company. I was invited there. And, I, and they, in the compound, it's probably the size of this park. You got four gates, north, south, east, and west. And I drove through the gate, armed people there. And they pulled me in. and. Um, we went down there and they wanted to give me a tour first. They asked me if I wanted a tour. I said, sure, I'd like a tour. Well, I didn't know the tour included all the military equipment. I was watching them down there making missiles and tanks. He said, do you want a picture of you in tank? I'm like, oh, sure. Why? And they said, picture. So they grabbed my camera and I'm in a tank. I stick it out on top of it. You know, I've got this little silly head thing on there. And he said, what's your wife's uh, email? We'll send picture to her. He's gonna go I don't know how to use my phone, but he did. He's sitting there on my phone, you know. So so he sends a picture there out in the tank. Finally, I get to look at optics, though. And, and he walks me down this big, long hall. How much time have I got, by the way? I don't go over. You got plenty. I'm going down a big, long hall, and they're flipping lights on, you know, and I look, and there's coding machines. I know what coding machines. You know what coach optics look like? And at the end, nice room. Now, I remember, the light was already on, and there was a woman in there, and she's just mopping the floor away. I mean, you can eat off this room. This room is clean. And uh, he goes, you know what that is? I says, yeah, that's a big coding machine. He goes, it's made in Germany. Do you recognize his name? I said, yeah, sure. He says, three in the world. I went, okay, there's three in that room. He says, that's all in the world. <laughs> okay, we own all three of them. $3 million U.S. each. I was, how do they use? Mm, not this year, don't need this year. I says, didn't even need to use it that year. And, uh, oh, okay, that's I said, oh, you don't ever make any nice, really high-end optics. That was it. The guy was too excited. He says, I'll take you somewhere. So they go down there. On this table's uh, telescope about this big, about this big around in front of it. it. Doesn't say anything really on it. I'm going to it and he gives me a picture of it, because he won't let me take a picture of it for some reason, but he gives me a picture of it. And I'm looking at it and the phone he goes, 16 inch calcium chloride telescope. I go, seven elements, two elements calcium chloride. I go, Whoa. This is the picture I need. I said, I know where I'll go next time. They said, you can't build a good app. Oh, I'll say, okay. So I took that to one of the shows. I think it was over in North Carolina. I took that picture to uh, that. I found it on my computer again. But uh, they had a 16 inch fluoride. And I found out what it was. It was a spy satellite. It was their camera for a spy satellite. I didn't know what it was until later, and I found out what the camera was. But it was real short. Had a big old cluster of electronics. I remember on the back of it, there was a huge cluster of electronics and a big, humongous lens in the front of that thing. It said one, two elements of calcium chloride. So they can make them, but uh, um, they really choose to make something in mass. You know, if it's not going to be mass produced, they're not interested. Until recently, recently they uh, they well, Celestron is no longer U.S. owned. And I heard the founder of Celestron died just the other day. I read that. And, yeah. You know, I met him in the weirdest place. I met him in Las Vegas at an optical show. I'm sitting there looking, talking to the same people, and I realize I read his day. He reads mine, and he goes, I go, you don't know me, but I know who you are. But uh, I met him there a few years ago. Anyways, uh, the stuff is uh, really neat that can be produced if they make enough of it. Um, the Celestron Company is now making exotic soaps. I don't know if you, I don't know if you have advertised. I'm not making up. If anybody advertising the new five element uh, pencils with two EV elements in it, Senta's making them now. Senta has a 80, a 100, a 120, and a 150. Three element airspace triplet in the front, the hardest thing to make. Astrophysics made airspace triplets for a little while, like 12 of them. 
because they could only produce like one every few months because they could not get the quality right on that. And they still, those are the worst telescopes they probably ever built. Tom Back over in Russia had his made, and his were the best ever built in there. They had it very hard to make six surfaces work with each other. It's much harder. When you oil or you cement, you take, you can take, well, it doesn't matter. You polish your two surfaces on top of each other. That's what you're going to do. Just put some in there, highs and lows are automatically filled. Guess what? You get a null, a null finish. Two and only if you're out, two outside surfaces that be critical. Those are usually your softest, gentlest curves, easiest to make. They're making airspace triplets, most difficult to make curves, especially to hold the orientation, by the way, in shipping. And you'll notice that um, uh, Jingua, or otherwise known as me, who is, uh, who's that? Explore Scientific, sells triplets. Those are airspace. Those are good telescopes, by the way, and you're not and we're not getting too many reports about a collimation. So they have really invented ways to hold the optics in the line. And the cells are critical. The material for the uh, cells are critical. Those are out there. Uh, but Senta now is making what, what's the company Explorer? Explorer Scientific. Okay. Yeah, they've got a 127. Been available for years. I saw those. What car. price range are they? Involved? Oh uh, well, the, I'll just tell you this much. I was offered the scopes many years ago, and I couldn't take them. It was, it was the commitment was huge. It was Jean Gua, the name of the company that makes it for them. And uh, they invited me there. I went to Jingua. They uh, did not have me. I mean, it was made over a million dollars. Uh, and, and I could have had all the scopes exclusively. They they were having trouble with me. Me over them six million dollars and had no way to get it. So uh, the same thing happened to Celestron. Celestron is owned by Senta simply because Celestron owed Senta so much that when they were for sale, Senta says, "Okay, here's what you owe us plus one million dollars for your company. We can buy the offer." And so they own they own Celestron. Almost the same thing happened to me. Me was owed. Uh, Jingua a lot of money, and so instead Jingua was looking for a new distribution, and, and uh, uh, one of the people who worked at Senta is actually who owns Explorer Scientific. Is that gentleman? Um, Scott Roberts. Yes, there you go. So he knew them already, already had a relationship with them, so he's got the product. And look what he's building, 123 field eyepieces. Is, is, is that the ethos? The no, the ethos was, was Al Nagler's 100 degree field eyepiece originally. And Al actually made a much wider than that years ago, but that's nothing. In 1940, the Germans came out with a 120 degree foot eyepiece. It had been made for a, for a submarine yes, submarine periscope. They needed the field of view 120 degrees. Very nice. Eye. You can go, you can type it in right now. It's called a um, what's that eyepiece called? Uh, oh yeah, Oracle. No. What's it called? Cold, cold, cold Kohler. Yeah. It's the Kohler eyepiece. You know, in 1900. Like yes, absolutely did. Periscope. Again, a periscope. periscope. They needed it for the periscope to get the field because they don't want that real narrow field of view. Right. They, look, they, right. see. they don't care if it's completely sharp right. because they can swing to that then, but right. they wanted to get that field of view out of it. And actually, with the glass we have today, we can do that. They're having a little problem with the uh, the 120 that they're making, that Gene Gua is making right now. Because uh, you can't come out with a so so eyepiece anymore. If you're an eyepiece company, you're not allowed to make a so-so IPC anymore. You have to come out with perfection to start with, or you'll be just discredited. You're just off. I mean, if yours is not equal, then you can quit it. You're not going to make it. It's not like Al. Al had time to develop his to get his better and better and better, and then this became a gold standard. All right, you must make a gold standard first time now. Either they sell for nothing and hope somebody else will die. You have to make a gold standard now. There's no in between. So only big, big players in that. Intex, uh, Al makes them. Uh, and Jingua makes them. Uh, Senta makes them. Senta's aren't as good. Senta's got 100 degree filled ones right now too. They sell through several different companies. Sell the Senta ones. Um, uh, they've got the optical engineers pass. Trust me, I met a gentleman over there. I still speak to his name, Mr. Lou. Uh, Tom Back, uh, I mean, knew him. Uh, he helped Tom with the uh, paradigms. The guy doesn't need a computer. He absolutely does not need a computer. He sees the optics in his head. He sees exactly which glass he needs. As he's entering the light, he's just sitting there adding the glass up and out the back. And all you do is say, I want 80 degrees. I'd like to have seven elements. And we'll all be giving you the parameters. And all of a sudden, he's sitting there going, OK, I've got your eyepiece. And then he'll send you a drawing of it. He's very good at it. He did some development on the Paragon for me and Tom. And one of the things he did was, was what started this. You can get now flat field ultra wide angle eyepieces. Forever, we were told that's impossible. Well, now that everybody ever, Al said you can't do that. Well, read Al's literature now on the ethos. You'll see how flat field is that. It was, it was Mr. Lou who solved that problem. And he solved it immediately. Uh, the key to flat field in my piece is similar path to the glass. 
In other words, the, the, uh, as, you, as you send light through glass and through air, it speeds up and slows down, you know, that causes problems too. And you want to have your glass path as similar as possible. That sounds like an eyepiece with no magnification, doesn't it? Because if the focal length through the glass or the air, the distance through the glass is similar, then it wouldn't work well. Anyway, there's a unique one that I remember that we came out of and immediately samples were bought by big companies. I know of Teleview buying them, I know of Pentex going buying them within the first week they came out because we were advertising uh, Paragons as um, uh, flat field. 99% of the field <coughs> was flat. Uh, now then that's easy to do because there's a way to do it. There is actually a way to do it with two elements you can install in it. But me, I'm working on eyepieces. Uh, me and Tammy have gone back to one thing that's very good for us and I don't know, many of you may have them. We sold binoculars for years. Oh, oh, we uh, saw uh, There was a little comparison probably 15 years ago between uh, 15 by 70. And we're all in Sky and Telescope, and they asked us, we had just come out with 15 by 70. And the Sky and Telescope says, Do you have one for us? I says, I'll express you have one up there. And they tested ours, and we got a favorable review. We said, Well, Burgess is as good as any of these, and he's a fraction of the cost. We sold a pair about every five minutes. Everywhere. I remember we time you get ready to go to dinner, I said, You got your phone? We were going on the phone and we just answered like they were forwarded from the company. We said, okay, we'll get it. And we were, uh, a member of the company could make about 300 pairs a month. And we were like two months behind. We said, well, you can get it on the next level. And it, I tell you what, that lasted for years. Because apparently you guys pull those out every once in a while, your old copies, and all of a sudden somebody would be calling us and said, why, we don't even have those anymore. Oh, no, I've got to have them for $99. And they won't be $99 anymore. They can be a, a lot cheaper. I got an office over there. And I got it. I've signed a couple agreements with some companies. I think this is going to help me because I've given them rights to my products in other countries. And I won't uh, do dealerships probably overseas as much. I used to have quite a bit of dealers overseas. I'll do less of that. I probably won't go through um, dealers anymore. It didn't work. Three times it didn't work. Partnerships work. If Tom's partnership work. The other partnership won't work. So we're developing stuff. Most of our new products will come in the cases. You're familiar with the uh, there's a brand Pelican case out there. Well. I'm going to make all the binoculars, and they're going to ship in these. The different sizes, not this one, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we add the copolymer to the plastics. Only thing different. In other words, ours is heavily shock shatter resistant, whereas most of the pelicans are reinforced, and they get, when it gets cold, they'll shatter. This is not. But same thing on the inside, the foam, and of course the ones that come with binoculars, or say you buy, we got some uh, two-inch diagonals, new two-inch diagonals. They'll come in their case too. These are already cut. Uh, they'll be custom cut for them. What's the difference in this foam and regular foam that you would get? As far as, because uh, I, I see it, some of it drives it, not in your It degrades, it dries them and degrades. Quickly, yeah. yeah so there does. must be some type of chemical coming out of it, and then you've got optics in there. Yep, yep, so. yep. You don't want that on these. These are dust and will not do that. They do not, uh, uh, what is that called? In, what is it called when it comes down to the yeah. yeah, yeah, almost, yeah, and your, uh, did you ever see those bottles, screw bottles, some of those outgassed too, I, I saw some people trying to get some awful films off of those at one time, they go, what happened to my optics, and I said, let me see your plastics, they had outgassed so bad, they had the vapor layer on all of his optics, and we were, acetone was the only thing, and finally we'd cut it off of there, I mean, it was, it was tough, it was like they'd been in a coating machine, and had a coating put on there, yeah, outgas, uh, definitely, mm -hmm. it doesn't do that, um, so, Excuse me. Just, so you build your own case for your telescope. You yes. Know, custom case. You better leave that foam out for a while and see if it gasses because if, if it's fresh. Well, is there a brand that we can buy to put in there? Yeah, you have the one that actually says that. I forget what the chemical it says is it doesn't have in it. I'll find that out though. There's a chemical you do not want to use. A, waffle, a waffle pad that yes. for your mattress, you yep. know? That, that, that out gasses that Bad. Foam. Yeah. And, and you put that in with your optics and then, you know. It's not good. <laughs> You're messed up. Because this one you want it. Because I want this to be able to be used without caps. You know, this is dust free. It's got a one-way valve on it. It only lets yeah, it only lets it only let air in air into it, okay? You can go out or out. I hate so it. Yeah. Oh, I do too. I, I want to be able to put them in there. I'll lose them and then you know. So you can cut them sideways. You just uh, take your phone, we're gonna call it because uh, puck how, what's it called? What's it called? Plug and pick, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we've been thinking of it. Because, yeah, I, I think we've got one. We're going to call it U Fit. You make your shape in there. Terry helps me with this all the time. If any of you have got an idea, they're getting ready to print my labels. I need a name for my case. I need a name for my case. Uh, so, if you can think of a name, a good name, it can be alphanumeric, it can be any box. 
Well, Terry's got it. He's kind of interesting one right now. It has that in here. If you come up with one, let me know. I'm going to give you a free. If you know what one I use, I'll give you a free case. We're going to make them in several sizes, too. Yeah, Burgess, Burgess safety case. Safety case is not yeah, bad. It doesn't shatter. No. It protects. It, it protects. It protects. One and a half pounds. You, you can have it free if it, if it works for you. Yeah. But uh, no, it, it's, it's what it is. And everybody wants to be safety minded with your office. Yes. Oh, oh, absolutely. I don't like having to put a keyword. I lose caps and stuff. So I even thought about in the binoculars, we're going to binoculars, that they'll actually have a separate slot for the cap. So you can just store the caps and put the binocular over the side of it. And forget about taking them off and losing them in the grass because everybody loses the black cap. I made white caps finally. Did you ever see my diagonal here by one of black caps and I got, I got griped at it? Ooh. And I went, Ooh. and they went, I went, buddy, shine your light down on this on the ground. And you see the pink object glowing right so there. What do you have for sale out here? You got I got some, I got a first load of cases came in. If you want these are $29 for the cases out here. I've got a bunch of my uh, uh, symmetrical series eyepieces. I've got some lasers. Now, if you want a blue laser, I'll be the first one up there. Not tonight, but if you want to be, go to the show. Yes, they finally got the good ones. They've been out for a while and they're hot. You know, there's no difference. Are these hot good safe? Are they all 5 milliwatts? So they're all FDA safe. The FDA tested lasers and found out that 5 milliwatts or less had a about 0% chance of damaging the eye, direct contact, zero. So that's why you can do five. That's, by the way, that's where my lasers are at right now. I have 100 of them, and they're stuck at Homeland Security, which they're always stuck at Homeland Security because of the And guess it's the FDA gets them, not, not Homeland Security. The FDA has them. They'll be about a week delayed. Trust me, I know it. I know it happens every time, so I was ready for it. I told Tammy we ordered them. I thought we ordered them safe for this show, but they'll probably be there to choose blue ones. If you want a blue one, just tell Tammy you want a blue one, and I'll ship one to you free. So when you go to the star party and you have 10 people with the green, all of a sudden the blue will go, and they're about to go, Ooh, and you can sure. you can be the first one. You can be the first one at the star party. Yeah. And now they have a, you know, you can't see the reds. The three to five mile wide reds, you can't see, uh-uh. They backed it down the freak the wavelength just a little bit toward the orange. It's a red, it's still red. It's actually very, you can now see it. So you can think the first one's red. And I would think those would be good because those won't damage your night vision either. You have a red one out there. Yeah. Terry's got something better. We tried to develop it. I'll work on it again later too. Terry has totally a uh, safe idea. Tay, you remember the focusing flashlights you could get with yeah. the bright LEDs? Yeah. Wow. He had, what color did you have? White? Mm -hmm. He had a white one and we were leaving the tent. No, we were leaving Florida. Uh, yeah. Cheap one. Cheap one. We're leaving cheaply and all of a sudden I have to stop. He goes, get out. Because we were right. And he shines his white and focuses it. And I could follow the square beam. So we said, hey, we need a green flashlight that does that right there. I've got three or four. I've got purple. I've got green. I've got the green one I could see. But boy, it took real dark. And you just need a real bright bulb. Probably jump back on that. But yeah, his white one was easy. Once I got real dark, there you could follow it. It's big. It's not like the little point of a laser. But we have an astro imagery in here. The red, does that protect his imaging? I think it will. To some degree, depending on what, what, what his, if he's, if he's trying to take that out. I see a smile come over Tom's face. <laughs> now the greens are horrible. Now the red, of course, you're, are, are you using a filter to cut the red anyway? A lot of people have filters in their digital to cut the red anyway. And so, you know, I, I know it's going to be a lot better than using the green. And they are available. Uh, the reds are still a little bit more expensive, about 50% more expensive. The blues have actually been out for a while. They're uh, about 10% more expensive. We're not going to change the price. It's going to be $15. I just won't, I'll just lose my 15 cents. And, uh, uh, make it back on the case. Make it, make it back on the case. There's always something to make it back on. My 15% box. <laughs> it was too long. It was too long. Yeah, no, no, yeah, we were, there's some uh, other stuff out there. Go see what Tammy's uh, got out there. Most of you own something from me. I, mean, I went to one star party and asked people what they own. Everybody in the room raised their hand. I'm like, whoa, whoa, been here for this two star party too long. But we're excited. We sold a lot of stuff to people. And we do. My goal was to make awesome affordable. You know, I don't own a Teleview outfit. I've never owned one in my life. I'm not saying anything first. I just couldn't see spinning. I just built something instead. I just go make. Or we went to uh, when I was making astronomy stuff. You had Edmonds and Jaggers. I built all Jaggers telescopes, reflectors. I mean, I built four and quarters, sixes, eights, tens, twelves, and uh, I enjoyed it too much. You know, I remember as a, as a kid, I needed a piece of pie. I got a bit in the mirror. And I said, "Summers are pretty more." So I was out there on my bike and there it was, the green plastic pipe. 
I wasn't going to take a purple one. That's too much like steel. It was a purple one. Too much like steel. It's a fractured section piece, kind of fun over on the bank by itself. I says, Well, I'll take that one. Well, that's not going to be a good deal. Well, I thought about it. I said, Well, I'll take that one. That stays there over a day. That's mine. So it did. And it was mine. So that turned into my next. Uh, so oh, yeah. The only thing you only have a problem with them are real thick wall. You get a six yeah, inch yeah. wave where you can use a steel tube and come out lighter than that. Yeah. But that's okay. We had a telescope too. So we were doing mm -hmm. telescope. You have one of these Ollie's, and there's a new chain now. They've got one in the little It's called Ollie's, and it's got some goofy looking, hillbilly looking guy. Anyway, you can do your Ollie's kind of head and name it just in case. Just, just in case. You'd be Justin. Justin says, get you a just in case. <laughs> anyway, we're making it. We'll, uh, you'll, I'll tell you real quick what we're up to, though. I haven't told anybody in two years right. what we're up to. I'll tell you all here at this start program. We're going to come out with binoculars again. I've mentioned before, binoculars make me a lot of money. I sold thousands and thousands and thousands of binoculars. Uh, here's what we're coming out with in the very short term. We'll have ultra wide series called Constellation Series. The cases will be black. Uh, they'll have a little picture of a constellation on the front. They don't need the name for it. I've got the name for it. And there'll be a, a pair of 7.5 by 32s in there with at least 11 degree field approach, approaching 12 degree field. So you can truly like look at Ursa Major and see almost all of it, but maybe the last star in it. You'll have uh, a nebula series. Now this one's real important to me because I've been wanting to do this for a long time. This will be a nebula, it'll be a 20 by 80, the only one because the small ones don't work. You have two flip in O3 filters. Flip them in, flip them out. They will beat any size binocular made on several deep sky objects that need a, need a filter. Oh yeah. You got it. There's the bell. Her 80 millimeter doctors will kill a 20 inch, 40 inch telescope, destroy it. No, oh, sitting right there waiting for you. Okay, then we have um, uh, a lunar series. You'll like my lunar series because I'm bringing back in the CBs, the old CB binoculars. That's what you saw for everybody. Uh, Celestron still sells them and everything. We've done one thing different. Uh, everybody has a strap. There's a little strap that covers the prism. That's all it is. There's a little metal spring. They put it in, they grab it, and it's in. It's got two grooves that go in. And there's a screw on one side to push the prism. We have screws on both sides so we all can push it. It can lock against it, okay? Not only that, we put an encapsulation strap. Double strap, hooks over the prism so they're about 10 times more sharp resistant than the regular CBs. And we're going to make those. And I'm now going to be at Monocular. We'll have 20 by 80s that cost less than $100. And they'll be very uh, highly sharp resistant, nice coatings, all the prisms, everything good on that. And they'll even come in a case that's almost going to cost $100. If you bought another case, it costs $100. They'll come in the cases too. Early. That's what I'm making short term. There'll be a high end pair of binoculars. The Mars series will be a Pobos. Do you want to say it pronounced correctly? That's right. Pretty close? Yeah. I've heard Terry say it. That's okay. And then we're going to make some, we're going to make some, we're going to make some eyepieces. I've got a lot of Tom back design. I have 2,400 optical products on my computer from Tom back. So, Questions. I said, take away too long. When's the nebula coming out? Nebula is being made. The first one's being made right now. I wanted to bring it. It just didn't get done in time. Just for just for here to show people the nebula. When it's a 20 by 80. Um, oh I know that's not the short one. Oh, that's it. Okay. The other pair of series of binoculars is the compact Toro CPPU. I've got. You'll be able to put a pair of 10 by 50s right here. I can put the 20 by 80s behind it, and all you'll see is the out bigger side. They're the same height. We put 80% more massive prisms in it to have the optical path folded inside the binocular. I'm not kidding you. I'm talking about our 80s. It's 12 inches tall, and I'll make it a 13x version for hand holding a pair of 80 millimeter binoculars. But our bodies is magnesium, so it's lightweight. It shouldn't weigh much more than a pair of 15 by 70s. And there'll be a 70 millimeter pair that's actually more compact as far as height than a pair of 10 by 50s. Yep, more compact. And we'll make that in a 12x. So you'll have a handheld pair again. Now these are now these are not going to be cheap. This is probably going to be my most expensive binoculars ever made. Uh, expensive to develop, but they probably will cost two hundred dollars. Now to you guys, you laugh that you think that's not expensive because a pair of eighties already cost more than that. But to me, that is. I like to keep most things under two hundred to keep the because uh, I like to sell them plus my manufacturers like them. Yeah, that one be nice and compact coming there too. We really appreciate no, no problem. I enjoy it. I haven't been out doing much because I've been sitting there developing. It's a little frustrating. But it's kind of fun to come back. Good to, to, to hear the story behind it. Good to see you're back. And we look forward to your products. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. What's that, Justin? Can you tell me what good one? He needs to have a wizard hat. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of worried about filling the space and then 
of an industry in there. Uh, we're not going to get into a lot of stuff that I was thinking about, but that's okay. It'll come up later. But right now, we, I'd like to bring up uh, Dr. Erica Gruntrum. And uh, I'll pronounce that on the chair. Is that good? Okay. She's uh, from Vanderbilt University. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and uh, she's bringing in the portable uh, 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 cafeteria. And uh, she's, you've had, you've done this program for about a year now or so or more? Oh, no, I've done this for probably two and a half years. Okay, I'm behind so, times so. again, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to tell you a little bit about that. And, uh, All right, forward. thank you. So, uh, again, I'm Dr. Erica Grenstrom. I'm from Vanderbilt University and Fisk University. And so I run the Portable Planetarium and I bring it around to schools in the Nashville area. And I've also gone out to a couple of uh, state parks as well, which has been pretty fun. And so uh, I've got the planetarium here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show off what's kind of going to be out in the sky tonight, uh, especially for people who you know don't know uh, necessarily what they'll be seeing. I also am planning on doing like maybe uh, one or two shows that talk a little bit about the mythology. I have all of the different mythology uh, things, uh, pictures with me as well. And so I've got Greek, I've got Native American, African, and um, you know, and then I've got a couple other things to do as well. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, the shows will be about 20, 30 minutes or so. And then uh, I might be doing a, a little bit of the, uh, or doing one of the talks since Rocky's not here. And uh, so I also work with Dyer Observatory in Nashville. And so Rocky Alvey is the director of Dyer, and he was supposed to be here, but he's not going to because he's been called by NASA because he and uh, one of, he's a singer-songwriter, and one of his friends, and he put together a really nice uh, CD. You know, they made this, they just published this really great CD of astronomy-based music, and so they are doing press releases and uh, things like that. So he couldn't be here today. So. Yeah. Uh, John stereotype stuff. Huh? Is it John no. stereotype stuff? No. I've got I've got the C D. Yeah, I do too actually. But um yeah, it's uh you know, it's a little bit of rock, there's a little bit of blues, there's a little bit of uh you know, whatever. And so it's uh you know, some calmer stuff, a little bit more rocking and and everything. And there's different guests of uh, people that they that the uh, so yeah, it should, you know that should be really fun too. And so I'll just kind of be doing the uh, all of that, uh, all planetarium stuff, and so I'll put out a schedule uh, as soon as we get everything situated with uh, with my talk later on. And so yes, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. But uh, we can fit about 25 to 30 people inside the planetarium at a time. And uh, I welcome the people coming in. So are there any questions about it or anything? About what might be going on or suggestions that you might have? So. Thank you. All right. Appreciate that. We appreciate you bringing it out. And yeah. the outreach. And outreach is, as you know, is paramount. It's extremely important. I mean, a lot of us have been doing it for, for decades now. Paul Lewis is huge into it. Two and a half years here with Erica, Dr. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen that. I've, I've seen that. Dr. G. I've Sorry. seen that. Uh, you know, yeah, Dr. G. Uh, all the emails so much back and forth, and uh, so I got comfortable with that. But uh, um, I see Chuck. Chuck in here. I guess he's setting up his his uh, models out uh, out front there. Uh, it, it, I don't know if you guys don't know Chuck or not, but he's. Uh, He's very knowledgeable, the ISS and other uh, NASA programs, and he has built, constructed models. He's, he's, he will have some of them on the table out there. Uh, he knows the history. He knows how these things function. Uh, he knows the different stages in which they were put up and put together and all this. And uh, hopefully, you know, he's probably didn't know the future of this, but <laughs> maybe he did use insights to it. But anyhow, don't, don't, uh, don't miss that. Uh, another thing uh, about this, uh, this planetarium, it's not just, it's not, it's for adults. And you heard the, the list of things that, that, uh, that uh, she, she can 
she can do that. And it's a wonderful thing. I've seen a couple of programs. And it's, after you get uh, not adapted, your eyes get not, then what, what, what's amazing about it? You, you go in first, and there's a few stars up there. And then and as you stay in there longer, longer, then you see more and more and more. As, as your uh, pupils dilate, so you know it, it gets better as it goes. <laughs> so it looks more and more like the nice staff. And it's, it's, it's a very good, very good program. Uh, anything else? Because we're just out of time. All right, can I make a quick announcement? If you don't mind. All right. I just wanted to head and uh, thanks, Lord. Appreciate it. Hey, um, just real quick. This is not a commercial endeavor at all. Uh, I'm the host of uh, the At the IP Show on Blog Talk Radio. And we do an astronomy-based podcast slash live talk radio program that doesn't focus on the science of astronomy, but more so towards what amateur astronomy is all, all about, which is stargazing tips, uh, observing reports, and equipment reviews. Uh, it's on every night at 7 p.m. on Sunday, Central Time. And I'm welcoming everybody to, if you want to call in, talk about anything, promote anything that you're doing, in regards to the astronomical community, outreach, club events, whatever it is, this is really your program. Uh, I'm just passionate about stargazing, as you all are, and uh, wish to go ahead and contribute to the community. So that's all that I wanted to go ahead and put out there. Uh, at, it's uh, Blog Talk Radio. Yes? Do you have a clue as to how big your audience is? We usually don't get, to be honest with you, a whole lot of live listenerships, but we range from anywhere from 590 to over 1,000 listeners on the archive. We're also on iTunes. So the nice thing about Blog Talk Radio is, yes, it's a live program when I am running live. Uh, we can support up to 25 simultaneous callers, so you can almost have a hosted type of an event as well, almost a round table if you wish. And um, we actually have listeners too in, in uh, uh, United Kingdom uh, as well. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of ranges and fluctuates. The shows are all archived off of Blog Talk Radio, so that makes it convenient. And like I said, every episode is also, uh, you can pull up from uh, iTunes. So uh, not commercial, it's all out of pocket from me, so I'm not trying to say anything. Just I uh, encourage you to stop in, take a listen, and if you want to call in, I'd love to hear from you sometime. All right. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, Lauren. Happy IPs. Lacey. Thomas would like to, he's got a short little two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my primary club is the Sidewalk Astronomers. I'm affiliated with about 10 other clubs. But I want to share with you something <coughs> that when I was a member of the Jackson Astronomy Club in Jackson, Michigan, and you people near Metro Centers can probably pull this off. I doubt if you could do it here. Uh, there's a place north of Detroit called Island Lake Recreational Center. And every year, we try to get about 30 to 35 amateurs with pretty good sized scopes. <clears throat> what the Detroit Club did was go into partnership with the Nature Company store, two or three optical shops up there. They would set up gazebo tent type things and offer their products. They do the students. And here's the deal, middle school students got a checkoff list of like seven, eight items, globular, open, galaxy, double, blah, 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 blah. If they got all of them checked off, they got a 20% discount on any science and astronomy stuff. The last year I participated in it was 99. There were 35 of us, and we ran 2,300 kids through that night. <laughs> And I, I gotta share one thing. There was this one little boy and his parents came up with him. I, I was doing M13 and he climbs up the scope and he looks through it and he goes, that's beautiful. And his mother broke into tears. And I'm like, what's the deal? And his dad said, he's autistic. That's the first thing he's spoken in 18 months. Folks, that stays with you. <laughs> that really stays with you. But if y'all could partner up, you people in Metro, <clears throat> Nashville, Knoxville, if you could find the stores to go into partnership, it's it's it promotes their sales. It promotes astronomy. It gets people out. It, it's just it's fantastic. So 
I just wanted to encourage you to do that. Something about the end zone science center in Tullahoma. Yeah, we, they have outreach to the uh, public first uh, Saturday of the month. And anybody close to Coffee County and the neighboring counties there, welcome to come and just see it. It's free. And if you want to bring your telescope, by all means, feel free to do that too. And uh, I'll have a website, the end zone science center on Tullahoma. In Tallahoma, Tennessee, you can Google it and find it. Um, so uh, it's okay. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, one other thing. <laughs> we late. started late, so why not? Paul and I can work together to get back on stage by the hip and fist off. Okay. Uh, Tom Burke, uh, you emailed me. So go about an international month long program. Uh, do you have time in your presentation to give a little word about that? And this afternoon. Okay, I'd love to, yeah, to do it now, but afternoon. run it over. And some of these folks look like they need to I knew that was take a little time here. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll tell you what, Will, anything else that's important that would you like to say or any questions or anything? Well, this has been a wonderful session. It really has. I appreciate all the input, the heartfelt uh, stories, and, and science is very worthwhile what you're doing. And good idea, too. So uh, what I'm going to do is, is five minutes and we'll be back and we'll have some we'll start a presentation. Okay, guys. Appreciate it. This talk is on useful astro accessories made for wood. Yeah, I was going to do another see if it's them or aircraft carriers. Okay. Uh, also, a member of the Crystal Astronomy Club. He's not my friend. First of all, I want to make a short announcement to you. Starfest will be held October 13th, 14th, and 65th. Be moved on the sixth. Yeah, I'll follow yeah. the enterprise around the mid. Uh, mm -hmm. I got well, thank you for doing this club. So I'd like to meet you too. And look through that is that Brave Mountain Club is providing with ETSU for science and uh